The very last speaker for today is uh, Ms. Amy Cotton, and she is the Deputy Commissioner for Trademark Examination Policy. In this role, Ms. Cotton oversees the offices of Trademark Policy Petition and ID class, as well as the Trademark Assistance Center, the Office of Trademark Quality Review and Training, the Trademark Law Library, Customer Experience, and Trademark Outreach. Uh, Ms. Cotton will be speaking to you about what is the Trademark Modernization Act and what resources are available for trademark owners, brand managers, and new trademark practitioners. Over to you, Ms. Cotton. Thank you so much, Hope, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am delighted to be with you today to discuss the Trademark Modernization Act of 2020 and the USPTO's plans for implementation. Now, if you have questions for me today as we go along, please send them to lanumques at uspto.gov, lanumques at uspto.gov, and include the title of the presentation, TMA, uh, in the subject line. I'm happy to try to take those questions as we go along. Now, I want to start with some context, right? Context for the TMA, what it was, uh, what it is designed to achieve. So basic trademark law, trademarks must be used in commerce on goods or in connection with services as a condition for obtaining and or maintaining a U.S. trademark registration. That's basic. So as you know, trademark applicants and registrants must provide proof of use, typically specimens, at particular points in the application and maintenance process, along with a declaration swearing that the mark is in use in commerce on all the goods and services in the application. The trademark system was designed to presume the good faith of our applicants and attorneys. The system has until recently relied on the deterrent of a law enforcement prosecution for perjury for filing false statements in a trademark application in order to keep our filers accurate and honest in their submissions to the USPTO. However, as most of us know, those law enforcement prosecutions have not yet happened, and thus there has been little to deter inaccurate submissions by those who would like to take advantage of the system. The register, the trademark register will pay the price is paying the price of these inaccurate submissions. Bogus use claims devalue the usefulness of the trademark register. Invalid registrations take up space on the trademark register and they create clearance problems for you and increase the costs of doing business. So to protect the integrity of the trademark register, the USPTO's goal is to improve the accuracy of the submissions we receive. And we have been advancing a variety of initiatives to do that over the last 10 years. The Trademark Modernization Act is just the latest uh, in those initiatives and required Congress to give us statutory authority. Next slide, please. About two or three years ago, uh, when we were facing a surge of applications with pretty sketchy specimens, Congress asked us how they could help. How could they help us respond to this trend and to the overall concern of false claims of use in trademark applications and trademark maintenance uh, declarations? First, we asked if the letter of protest procedure could be codified so that we could have the clear authority to charge a fee. Next, we asked for the authority to shorten the standard six month response time so that we could move suspicious applications through the system faster and dispose of them. Lastly, we asked for non-use cancellation procedures that were faster and cheaper than a contested trademark trial and appeal board proceeding. Congress passed the TMA in 2020, and they gave us just until December 27, 2021 uh, to implement most of the proceedings necessitated by the statute. So we were on a tear. We had to move quickly. We consulted with our stakeholders. Uh, we drafted the notice of proposed rulemaking. It's called the MPRM. I'll be referring to the MPRM today uh, for the TMA. And we issued it for public comment on May 18th. It is open for public comment for a period of 60 days. We need to get your written formal comments on the MPRM uh, through the regulations.gov portal by July 19th so that we can take those in and look at uh, the final rule and how we're going to implement these proceedings. So in addition to the three things that I mentioned we asked for Congress, we also included in the MPRM some proposals for the fees for petitions requesting institution of ex parte expungement and reexamination, those non-use cancellation proceedings, and fees for requests to extend the office action response deadlines. We've proposed amendments to the rules concerning suspension of USPTO proceedings and the rules governing attorney recognition and trademark matters. And a new rule is proposed to address procedures regarding court orders, canceling or affected registrations. Next slide. 
All the rules in this notice of proposed rulemaking are subject to change based on what you say to us during the formal comment period. These rules will not take effect until the final the date indicated in the final rule. Uh, but of course, for expungement and reexamination, those non-use cancellation proceedings, those we have to have implemented by December 27th, 2021. For the flexible response periods, the TMA does not dictate a date of implementation, so we're proposing a delayed date of implementation of June 27, 2022. Next slide. And again. So the letter of protest, that's that first bucket that I said we asked Congress for. Now, we've already done this. The letters of protest procedure, um, we actually have had these rules, uh, had the practice in place for many, many years. Um, this was, TMA was a codification of it, and we actually issued the rule last year uh, that makes everything in our, in our rules consistent with the statute. Now, all we're doing here in this MPRM is tweaking the rule a bit. Uh, it's a 37 CFR 2.149. We're mirroring the statutory language that any determination by the USPTO director whether to include the letter of protest evidence in the record of an application shall be final and non-reviewable, and that such determination shall not prejudice any party's right to raise any issue and rely on any evidence in any other proceeding. So I would note there, because I've gotten questions on this point, Codifying the existing letter of protest procedure has not resulted in any changes to the practices that have been in place for many years, except now we can charge a fee, which is $50. Uh, and now we have a time deadline of two months in which to make a determination on wh whether to send the evidence that a third party protester gives to us, whether to send that evidence to the examiner because it is relevant to a ground of refusal. Uh, if we, once we send it to, um, to the examiner, they make a determination of whether to issue the refusal. Next slide. Now, the second bucket uh, in the TMA is a flexible response period. Next slide. On this provision in the MPRM, the, actually the MPRM presents three different options. Um, one in the, in the rule text and two are in the explanatory comments. And we would like comments on, from you on, on all of these. All of the options would apply to response period in examination and in the post-registration context. However, the, the flexible response period would not apply to a Section 66A Madrid application, and that's because the various treaty provisions and requirements and procedures of the Madrid system for the international registration of marks at the World Intellectual Property Organization would make it really difficult for international applicants and registrants to meet our shortened deadlines, so we're just carving those out. Next slide. So like I said, three options. Um, the data uh, with regard to applicants uh, responding to office action shows that there's a big, uh, a big component of people who, apply, who uh, respond in the first one or two months after the office action issued. And then it goes way down. And then there's a, a, a big bump at the end where presumably docketing systems kick in and people respond at the very end. So we thought, okay, I think we can, we can move uh, that deadline from six months, which is pretty long, and it was, it was created in the world when we had postal mail as the way we were communicating. Um, now we're in a different world, and we think we can shorten that response period. So we are proposing a three-month re standard response period for all office actions that would be extendable one time to the full six months. Uh, we're proposing $125 extension fee per request, not per class, per request. So $125 to extend to the full six months if you choose. Now, originally we're thinking, okay, we should have a shortened response period for simple office actions and maybe a, the longer response period for more complex office actions. But it, it becomes really difficult to try to distinguish which ones are simple and which ones are complex. Uh, and certainly from a docketing system perspective, it's just easier and cleaner to go three months extendable up to six. So we reflected that in the rule text of the NPRM. Uh, but of course, we have two more options for, for folks to, to consider. Option two, it proposes two separate response periods that could form the basis for implementing a two-phase examination system. So this was something that actually we were toying with because as you might know, we're, we're facing a, a significant surge in applications and we're looking for any way to try to increase examination efficiency. Is there a way that we can handle formalities examination first and substance of an examination second in a two-phase process? Uh, the only way to do that then is to you know, have a shortened response period, uh, but have two response periods. So what we're proposing 
is a formalities examination with a two month response period. But under the TMA, we have to provide for extension up to six months. So maybe we go two months, two months, two months, up to the full six months. Then you enter the second phase, and then there's a substantive examination, and that would have a three month response period. Also has to be extendable all the way up to the full six months. Now, if you do the math, uh, you realize that this option could result in an increase in total pendency for a particular application if all extensions are pursued. So maybe that defeats the purpose of trying to move applications through the system faster, but we're just sort of looking at all kinds of different options to see what would work best for us to handle uh, the, the big surge in applications and move applications through the system more quickly. Now the third model, of course, uh, I know this is a, a trademark uh, NPRM, but we always have to have some sort of patent component, right? Um, the patent model, it's kind of the patent model, not quite, but the initial response period in every case would be two months. Uh, it could be extended in increments, though, up to the full six months. The applicant must ex refile the extension request and the fee within the response period, and the extension fees get progressively higher as the applicant requests more time to respond. Um, now, the application would go abandoned if the deadline is missed without an extension request, but of course, a petition to revive would be available. Uh, it must include the applicable extension fee, depending on when that petition would be filed after the initial missed deadline. Now, we're looking for comments uh, on any of these options, all of these options. Maybe there's another option that you have that would be helpful. Uh, what would be most useful to you and what would be most useful to us in trying to move applications through the system more quickly? All right, now moving on to the third bucket, the non-use cancellation mechanisms. This is really where the action is with the, the TMA. So I wanna spend some time here. Next slide, please. Okay, so new proceedings in the TMA to cancel registrations for non-use, uh, and the NPRM proposes the procedures to implement those proceedings. Now, the first one is expungement. Now, you might be familiar with this if you've ever done pra any practice in Canada. This is uh, the, the inspiration for this proceeding and the name of it uh, came from the Section 45 uh, Canadian provision. Different, not the same, but it was, it was the inspiration for it. Okay, so the target of an expungement proceeding is a mark in a Section 1, use-based, 44, Paris, 66, Madrid registration, where the mark has never been used on some or all of the goods and services identified in the registration. So the petition to request institution of expungement proceedings may be filed in the window of time, must be filed uh, in the window of time between year three and year 10 post registration. So that's the window in which these proceedings can be filed for expungement. Now also the TMA creates a claim because this is a new, new claim, expungement, not, not one that's existed before, so this is a new claim. We've also provided it at the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board uh, as a new ground for cancellation under Section 14. Keep in mind though, you know, I said there was a window of time, year three to year 10, when the proceeding is before the director. When the proceeding is before the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board, it doesn't cut off at year 10. The timing is different. Once you're at year three, an expungement proceeding, uh, an expungement claim can be brought before the TTAB at any time. Also know, that the new claim of expungement does not affect any other available non-use claim at the TTAB, doesn't affect abandonment or non-use, and it does not affect the timing of those, of those claims. Totally different. Further point about timing though. These are only as to expungement petitions. The, the statute itself created an exception and says, okay, while normally there's a window between year three and year 10 where these proceedings can be filed before the director for a period of three years after enactment, two years after implementation, a petition for expungement may be filed against any registration that's over 10 years old. So that window will not apply for, for the next, for two years after we implement this. Uh, and that is to basically anything that's sitting on the register and, and, and folks want to try to clear that deadwood off right away, you've got two years to do that through an expungement proceeding. Now, I wanna make a, a point because this was something that I think some people missed uh, in our public roundtables that we held on June 1st and June 14th at the USPTO. A claim of expungement is fundamentally different than a claim of abandonment. Abandonment, as you know, requires non-use plus intent not to resume use. Now, expungement, on the other hand, does not require evaluation of the registrant's intent. Expungement is an entirely new basis 
a new statutory basis for cancellation that only evaluates whether the mark was used on the challenged goods and services prior to the date of the filing of the expungement petition. It does not evaluate whether the mark was put into use as of the dates required in the statute. That is re-examination, which I'll turn to next. So, expungement, re-examination. This is the second of the proceedings. Now, the target of a re-examination proceeding is a Section 1 registration that was not put into use as of the relevant date. What's the relevant date? Well, for a 1A application, it's the filing date, of course, uh, presuming that it wasn't amended at any time to a 1B filing basis. The relevant date for a Section 1B application is the later of the filing date of the AAU or the ex expiration of time to file the statement of use. So now the window here for, for filing these, a petition to request institution of re-examination proceedings may be filed in the first five years of the registration. Then the window is closed. So basically we're opening up the registration that issued within the first five years and going back and looking at the claims of use that were made during the application process. Now, for both expungement and re-examination, once the window for these proceedings before the director is closed, these tools are no longer available. But of course, you can always go to the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board or a federal district court and go with non-use, abandonment, or expungement as appropriate. So these tools have a window of time when they're before the director. Next slide, please. So the NPRM lays out the matching procedures that will be followed in both expungement and re-examination proceedings. The procedures are very similar. The differences, of course, are the timing, as I said, and the evidence is going to be slightly different as well. But for, our, for the most part, these are, are pretty, very, pretty much going to be similar and handled in, in similar ways. Now, $600 per class petition fee. This fee was designed to strike a balance between cost recovery and providing a less expensive alternative to a contested TTAB proceeding, right? That was the whole point was to create a faster, cheaper, uh, efficient way to clear Deadwood off the register um, and without having to go to the board. So it's got to be it's got to be uh, comparable to a board proceeding or or uh, faster and cheaper. OK, so who can file a petition? Any person, the statute says any person may file a petition requesting that either expungement or reexamination proceeding be instituted. Only one registration per petition will be allowed. Now you have to choose the basis of the petition. It's either expungement or reexamination, not both in the same petition. However, well, combining them in one petition would be efficient, but from an IT perspective, it is difficult to do that. Also, from an evidentiary perspective, it might it doesn't make sense. The evidence for re-exam and the evidence for expungement uh, of it's going to be different. So we want to keep them into separate pet petitions to make that clear. But of course, if they're filed separately, we will combine review of them by the same examiner when it's the same registration at issue. All right, I'm going to go back to that any person because I get this question a lot about standing. Any person can file. So the statute itself makes clear that there should be no standing requirement for the petitioner. Now, the petitioner is not anonymous uh, because the petition must be filed through T's, and that means through a USPTO.gov account. Also, the petitioner must provide a domicile address so that we can determine if the domicile is foreign, if the petitioner is foreign domiciled, and thus would need to include the designation of a US attorney in the petition. If the attorney is designated, the petition must include the attorney name, postal address, email address, and bar information. Now, if the petition is filed but it's incomplete, we're going to give you the option of a 30-day letter in order to complete uh, the, the missing information. All right, now, going back to the anonymity question. So the question is, is the petitioner anonymous? Um, the answer is, well, they're, no, they're not anonymous, but do we know who the real party in interest is? No. Um, right now, the USPTO is not currently proposing in this rule package that the petitioner be required to identify the real party in interest, and we're doing that for two reasons. First, if the petitioner establishes a prima facie case of non-use, it really makes no difference for purposes of adhering to the intent of the TMA who that petitioner is or whom she or he or she is representing. The ultimate goal of the proceedings is to clear Deadwood from the register regardless of who requested the proceedings. Second, once the petitioner files the petition, the petitioner is out of the process. 
to hold a petitioner accountable in the context of these proceedings for failing to provide accurate information as to who the real party in interest is, that would require the petitioner to be a party to the proceeding throughout. But that was not the intent of the TMA. But we have a solution. Instead, we believe that the petitioner who uses the proceedings to harass registrants could be sanctioned outside the context of the proceeding. That is, through the sanction authority of the Commissioner for Trademarks. So the Commissioner for Trademarks may sanction individuals making submissions to the USPTO for improper purpose. So if the USPTO were to discover through our ongoing investigations for fraudulent and bad faith submissions, we have a special task force that's doing this. If, if we've discovered that a petitioner was abusing the proceedings, the USPTO could preclude future submissions in any proceeding before the USPTO by the petitioner and the party the petitioner may be representing. And we could terminate any USPTO.gov account created by the bad actor. So even though in the context of the proceedings, a petitioner um, might be using it improperly, we can come at it in a different way. Once the complete petition is filed, a courtesy email notice of the filing of the petition will go to the registrant and the registrant's attorney. We want to make sure the registrant has early notice that something could happen so they can make sure they're paying attention. The petition and the evidence will also be uploaded immediately into the Trademark Status and Document Retrieval, TSDR, and it'll be, it will be made public. Now, no response from the registrant to the filing of the petition will be accepted unless and until the proceedings are instituted. Next slide. We've got some questions coming in on the chat, but I am going to come back to those in a few minutes and get through a little bit more of the, the mechanisms here. Okay, so the petition um, must include a verified statement that identifies the element of the petitioner's investigation of non-use. What, where did you search? How did you search? When did you search? And what did you find as to each of the source of, sources of information that you relied on? Now, the reasonableness of the search and then uh, the number and the nature of the sources the petitioner must search will be determined case by case, and that makes sense. The evidence of non-use that's sought will necessarily differ depending on the nature of the goods and services at issue in the proceeding and their relevant channels of trade and advertising. The sources must be reasonably accessible and ones that can be publicly disclosed. So the sources, appropriate sources of evidence and information for a reasonable investigation may include, but they're not limited to, state and federal trademark records, internet websites and other media likely to be, or likely to or believed to be owned or controlled by the registrant, internet websites, other online media, publications where the relevant goods and services likely would be advertised or offered for sale, print sources and web pages likely to contain reviews or discussion of the relevant goods and services, records of filings made with or of actions taken by any state or federal business registration or regulatory agency. Next slide. Additional sources, the registrant's marketplace activities, including, for example, any attempts to contact the registrant or purchase the relevant goods or services, records of litigation, administrative proceedings reasonably likely to contain evidence bearing on the registrant's use or non-use of the registered mark, and any other reasonably accessible source with information establishing that the mark was never in use in commerce, that's expungement, or was not in commerce as of the relevant date, re-examination. Next slide. Okay, so the verified statement has the reasonable investigation in it, and it's got the evidence, and the evidence needs to establish a prima facie case. The director decides whether uh, the director is really the gatekeeper, and they, the director decides whether the prima facie case is made, and it's based on evidence and information in the petition and the USPTO's electronic record of the involved registration. The director has the authority to institute a proceeding without a petition if the director has evidence establishing a prima facie case. This is director-initiated uh, proceeding versus a petition-initiated uh, proceeding. So for an example, um, the director could institute a proceeding on different goods and services in the same registration that's already the subject of a petition initiated proceeding. So if the director had evidence, additional evidence of non-use beyond what was in a petition, uh, the director could institute his own proceeding. Now, 
he can't, um, the director can consolidate review of those two uh, proceedings, and that would be related parallel proceedings that could include both expungement and reexamination grounds. A prima facie case of non-use requires only that a reasonable predicate concerning non-use be established. Now, if the prima facie case is established, the director must institute proceedings. And if proceedings are instituted, just as in examination, the burden of proving non-use by a preponderance of the evidence lies with the director. Now, if the prima facie case is not established in the petition itself, the director will not institute petition-based proceedings. The director will not add evidence to a deficient petition to establish a prima facie case and then institute. However, like I said, if the, if the director has his own evidence that establishes the prima facie case, the director could institute a proceedings on his own without the petition. Once proceedings are instituted, um, the office action will issue and it directs the registrant to respond within two months with proof of use of the mark on the challenge goods and services. The director's decision to institute proceedings based on the prima facie case is final and non-reviewable. Next slide. Okay, so the registrant now has two months to respond. The registrant is subject to the USPTO's rule on electronic correspondence, domicile address, and representation by US counsel if foreign domiciled. Now the registrant has three options for the response. Provide evidence of use, provide evidence of excusable non-use with the declaration, or deletion. Starting with evidence of use. The registrant must provide such evidence of use, information, exhibits, affidavits, or declarations that may be necessary to rebut the prima facie case by establishing that the required use in commerce has been made. Any documentary evidence of use need, doesn't have to be specimens uh, at, under Section 1 of the Act, but it must be consistent with the definition of use in commerce in section, section 45. But we expect that specimens are what we're probably going to get for the most part, but there may be situations where they're not available anymore. Uh, in those cases, the registrant could provide additional evidence and explanation supported by declaration. I will point out that resubmitting the same specimens that are already contained in the USPTO's records without additional evidence will likely be insufficient to rebut the prima facie case. Keep in mind the office already reviewed the USPTO's records to determine whether to institute proceedings. So we already know what was in the file and there was evidence to suggest that those were not acceptable. So we need more evidence. Testimonial evidence may be submitted but should be supported by corroborating documentary evidence. So for expungement, the proof of use must show that the use occurred before the filing date of the petition. And for reexamination, the proof of use must show that the use occurred on or before the relevant date. Now turning to the second option for response, excusable non-use. Now this is narrow. This only applies to section 4466 registrants in the context of an expungement proceeding. It is not available to section one registrants in an expungement proceeding or in a reexamination proceeding. For purposes of treaties, um, excusable non-use is a treaty entitlement for Paris and Madrid registrants. So it does not apply to the Section 1 registrants because those, uh, those registrations were not issued under the auspices of the treaty provisions. And it only applies, this excusable non-use for these foreign um, registrants, only applies an expungement. Because if you think about it, the Section 44 and the 66 registrants did not have to establish use in, during the examination of their application. Uh, that, you know, that's not a condition for registration for, for them, and so there's nothing to go back and re-examine. So they, excusable non-use is not, uh, not going to be uh, available in re-examination. So as for deletion, that's the third option for response. A registrant may delete some or all of the challenge goods and services in his response with immediate effect. Now keep in mind, a registrant may not amend an identification in the context of these proceedings. This would be an issue, for example, if the proof of use does not match the identification of the goods and services being challenged. Maybe the applicant had made a mistake in identifying the goods and services in the application and never fixed it. Um, but now you can't, in the context of these proceedings, amend the ID to match the proof of use. However, the registrant could file a Section 7 amendment, uh, narrow the ID within the scope of the original, and then notify the amendment to the expungement or reexamination examiner for consideration if the registrant didn't do so prior to the proceedings. But I would recommend that they do so prior to the proceedings. So if the registrant's response proposes deletion, 
in uh, expungement or reexamination proceedings. Just so you know, we do not intend to charge the $250 per class deletion fee uh, unless the deletion occurs simultaneously with a post-registration examination or audit. So to remind you all, uh, the deletion fee is a $250 per class fee charged when goods and services are deleted in the context of the examination of a Section 8 or 71 declaration to maintain a registration, including an audit. To avoid the deletion fee, pretty easy, registrants should file an accurate, accurate Section 871 declaration that reflects only the goods and services for which the mark is in current use. Hopefully that's not too much to ask that it be accurate. Um, so deletion in the context of the expungement uh, reexamination proceeding, you know, that's you, you, you can delete in the response to the office section, but also you could file a section seven amendment for zero fee. We, we lowered the fee to zero if you're going to delete uh, unused goods and services from the registration through section seven, or the registrant can voluntary, voluntarily surrender the entire registration. Now, both the Section 7 amendment or the surrender must be notified to the expungement and reexamination examiner in the registrant's response for that response to be acceptable. We don't necessarily know that those transactions have occurred and been accepted unless the registrant tells us that in the response. Okay, so if the response from the registrant is found to be acceptable, the proceedings terminate immediately and no cancellation order issues. Next slide. Okay, no response by the registrant. What is that? What happens then? No response means immediate cancellation for the goods and services on which the proceeding was instituted. So if there is no response, whichever goods and services were the subject of the institution order, those will be canceled. Not the entire class, not the entire registration, just those that were attacked on which proceedings were instituted. Now, of course, uh, a petition for reinstatement is available if the failure to respond was due to extraordinary circumstances. Typical timelines for these petitions apply. The response to the office action that, that is outstanding would be required along with the petition and the fee. And it's worth noting here that the MPRM adjusts the due diligence monitoring rule such that registrants must monitor the status of the registration at least every two months after notice of institution of these proceedings. Now, in the MPRM, we're looking for comments uh, from you all on the issue of non-response. One of the questions that we're putting out for discussion is whether a registrant who fails to respond to the office action should have his or her registration flagged for later audit. So if we target it for later audit, we can find out if the rest of the registration that was not challenged in the proceeding holds up under further scrutiny. Uh, but of course, this means from a best practices perspective, not responding to an office action action and allowing a deletion to occur without affirmatively responding and deleting the challenge goods and services would no longer be an option. Okay, so if the registrant's response is unacceptable or it's incomplete, a final action will issue. You had the first action and the final action. There's a two month response period. We're also looking for comments on whether we should issue a 30 day letter for a timely bona fide attempt uh, to respond to the first office action, but which omits some matter of, of compliance. Next slide. The final action uh, in an expungement proceeding will include the examiner's decision that the registration should be canceled for each good or services for which the mark as deter was determined not to have been used, never, sorry, never to have been used in commerce or for which excusable non-use was not established or for non-compliance with any requirement under Rule 2.11, U.S. Council. Rule 2.23, failure to provide an email address for electronic cor correspondence. Or Rule 2.189, failure to provide a domicile address. The final action for a reexamination proceeding includes the examiner's decision to cancel the registration for each good or service for which the mark was not in use on or before the relevant date, or for non-compliance with the rules I just mentioned. The registrant must respond to the final action with a request for reconsideration and a notice of appeal. Now, again, if there's no response, the USPTO will terminate proceedings and order cancellation of the attacked goods and services at issue. Again, a petition for reinstatement is available, but only for extraordinary situation. But if the request for reconsideration contains acceptable proof of use, we will terminate the proceedings and no cancellation order will issue. Otherwise, the examiner's decision to cancel is appealed to the TTAB and the regular board timelines will apply. Next slide. 
Okay, now estoppel. Goods and services for which use in commerce has already been established uh, may not be subject to further expungement or re-examination proceedings. This is estoppel. So if you've already been at your registration, particular goods and services in your registration have been attacked, you've provided proof of use, and the registration stands intact, those goods and services can't be attacked again. The registration can be attacked as to other goods and services that were not part of, are part of the original proceeding. But those that have been attacked and survived, they are um, subject to estoppel and no further proceedings before the director can be brought. The estoppel provisions do not apply to a subsequent board proceeding. So whatever happens before uh, the director does not affect uh, subsequent board proceedings from an estoppel perspective. So even if a registration is subject to an expungement or re-examination proceeding before the director, that registration may still be challenged at the TTAB on a claim of expungement, abandonment, or non-use as appropriate. Next slide. Relationship to other proceedings. Expungement and re-examination are now included in the, in the rule, in the NPRM, you'll see it, um, among the types of proceedings for which suspension of action by the office or the TTAB is authorized. Furthermore, the NPRM proposes also to amend the rules to reflect our current suspension practice. Right now, uh, the, the TTAB will suspend proceedings when another proceeding that is relevant to registrability of the involved mark is ongoing. But the rule, as it's currently written, uh, basically says that the suspension practice is limited to proceedings where the exact same party or parties are engaged in that other proceeding. That's not what we're actually doing. So we're trying to make sure that our practice is matched by the rule text. We want to make sure we can look at the relevance of the proceeding to the registrability of the registration rather than to the parties who are at issue. Next slide. All right, this is a little small, uh, but for those of you who, of those who like visuals, this might be useful. Uh, this slide will be, uh, it's posted on our website, our TMA website at the USPTO.gov, uh, so you can take a look at it later. But let me walk you through this simple, simple version. So the process begins with a petition against the registration and it goes to an examiner. Now this examiner is not the original examining attorney who looked at the file. Um, this is, we use the word examiner, not examining attorney, because we're still trying to figure out how many of these we're going to get, where we should house them, who should be responsible for looking at them. But we know that these proceedings are going to be complex. So these will be done certainly by uh, those who are experienced in this sort of work. Uh, there are two outcomes when the examiner looks at the petition, looks at whether the investigation was reasonable, and looks at the evidence um, the supporting non-use. The uh, examiner will decide whether to institute or whether to deny institution. If the examiner decides to institute, then the examiner will also at the same time send out in the institution decision as well as the first office action. It's going to be a combined mailing. In response to the office action, the registrant has two months to submit a response. Now the examiner is going to review that response and decide if the response is acceptable because it establishes use, excusable non-use, or deletes the challenge goods and services, then the proceeding will terminate. If the response is unacceptable because the proof of use is not established, or perhaps another requirement was not complied with, a final office action will issue. Now again, if there is no response, the goods and services are just canceled. And that registration will be targeted for later post-registration audit due to the non-response to the office action. Now, for those cases where a final action is issued, the registrant again has two months to respond and file a request for reconsideration with more evidence of uh, proof of use, as well as file a notice of appeal. The examiner reviews the request for reconsideration to see if that additional proof of use or the requirements, uh, I'm sorry, compliance with the requirements uh, required was acceptable. If acceptable, the proceeding terminates um, and uh, no cancellation order issues. If not acceptable, the proceeding goes to the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board who handles the appeal uh, and normal timelines apply. And if there's no response to the final action, again, the challenge goods and services are simply canceled. Okay, so that was a lot on uh, non-use cancellation mechanisms, but as you can tell, 
uh, there's a lot of attention uh, to, paid to that, and it's been a lot of work to make sure that the proceedings um, are, are logical and, and spelled out and uh, contain all the bells and whistles that they need to while being efficient and, uh, and, and fast. Okay, next slide, please. Now we're going to move on to other parts of the NPRM, uh, particularly the attorney recognition for representation rules. Next slide. So these rules are not part of our TMA implementation, but they're definitely driven by our need to have clear correspondence rules and also to implement part of our register protection initiatives of which the TMA is part, as you recall, um, this, our database login uh, project. So under our current rule, recognition ends when an application is abandoned, a registration expires or is canceled, or it changes ownership. Now, under the proposed rule, recognition would instead continue after those events. So that means that in order to end the recognition of the attorney by the USPTO, owners and attorneys would be required to proactively file an appropriate revocation or withdrawal document rather than the current situation where recognition automatically ends and you don't have to do anything. We wanna make this change to the rules in order to match our practice. Now, the background for this, of course, lies with our correspondence rule. Now, you may know, although maybe you don't because our practice doesn't match the rule, the USPTO is supposed to correspond only with the applicant or the registrant if the applicant or registrant is not represented by an attorney. So if recognition of the attorney has ended after certain events, we should stop sending correspondence to the attorney. But we don't um, because stakeholders told us not to follow our correspondence rule. Uh, attorneys wanted they, they wanted to continue receiving correspondence so they could know when the post-registration filings were due, for example. So we want to amend our rules to reflect the practice. Additionally, uh, this rule change, as I noted, will facilitate implementation of the role-based access control system for applications and registrations that we are developing. So as part of the USPTO's forthcoming identity verification process for USPTO.gov account login, Users are also likely to be assigned a limited number of roles to control and delegate access to filings. These roles include attorney, attorney support, owner, or public administrator roles. Only those roles would have access to the file wrapper and could make any changes or amendments to the file. And this would certainly cut down on unauthorized changes of correspondence that we see perhaps of application or registration hijacking. So if we were to retain the current rule, in order to submit the TEAS form to file a maintenance document on behalf of a client, the role-based access controls would require the no longer recognized attorney to first go to the owner and request IT permission before the attorney could file the maintenance documents. And we're concerned about missed deadlines. And when you add steps to the process, certainly you have missed deadlines. So we want to fix the rule to match our practice and allow us to assign rules so that we can tighten up the security on our database login. Next slide, please. We are also proposing in the MPRM a rule change to clarify attorney obligations when withdrawing from representation and differentiate the grounds under which the attorney may request to withdraw versus those situations where the attorney must request withdrawal. This will allow us to be consistent with the USPTO rules of professional conduct. Now, I want to point out, you know, as much as some folks might like us to just simplify the withdrawal process, if we're going to, if we're going to have you withdraw now, instead of just let, re letting recognition end, if we're going to have you withdraw, you know, the idea is simplify the withdrawal, right? But the problem is the rules of professional conduct dictate the terms for withdrawal. So we cannot create, you know, a withdrawal process that isn't consistent with the conduct rules but we certainly are going to update our forms to make it hopefully easier to withdraw. Uh, so keep, in that, keep that in mind as you look at these rules and think about how your practice could change. Next slide, please. Now, the last thing to touch on in the uh, MPRM, and this is really a housekeeping issue, is court orders. Next slide. We added a proposed rule to the MPRM uh, to codify the USPTO's longstanding procedures concerning action on court orders, canceling or affecting a registration under 15 USC 1119. As you know, the USPTO requires submission of a certified copy of the court order, and normally we don't act on such orders until the case is finally determined. So we're just aligning the practice, uh, putting the in practice into a rule. Next slide. 
So that was a whole lot to tell you what's in this rule package, um, but it was really designed to facilitate your efforts to provide formal comments to the regulations.gov portal. This is the link where you would go to submit the comments. Uh, you use this docket number and you can, uh, you can submit your formal comments that will be considered in the rulemaking, um, formal rulemaking process. And of course the comments are due by July 19th. Um, we really would like to hear from you so that we can make sure we issue a final rule and have procedures that everybody likes. Next slide. So here are some resources uh, on the USPTO website, some links for you. Um, we held two public roundtables on June 1 and June 14th, uh, where basically I went over exactly what I just went over today uh, and took questions from the audience as best we could with what we know now. Certainly there's a lot of, of questions that we're going to have to answer as we get closer to implementation and we're developing the examination guidance. Those public roundtables were recorded. The slides and the recording are available on our website. So if you'd like to go see what other people were asking towards the end, of the, you don't have to repeat what I just said today. Don't speed to the end and look at the questions and the answers at the end if you're interested in that. These links are also to the legislation and the committee report. The committee report gives you helpful background on what it is that Congress intended um, for, for these procedures to look like and how to operate. And we are trying to make sure that our rules, our, our proposed draft rules in the MPRM match that. So we'd love you to review that. And let us know if we got it right. Next slide. So I put together uh, the next three slides are really just for your reference. Uh, if you want to know which rules we touched uh, then and to make uh, tweaks here and there or which rules we had to create from scratch to to uh, to implement the, t the TMA, here they are. So you've got the conforming amendment to the rule for the letter of protest. Remember the, the rules for the letter of protest were already embedded in 2.149 last year uh, and we're just tweaking. Here you've got um, shortened response periods, a whole bunch of rules that we had to tweak uh, in order to adjust the rules to match that, that first option of the three month response period. Next slide. We had to create some new rules for the non-use cancellation proceedings. You can see they're, they're labeled here and we have some conforming amendments as well. So um, that shows you what, what is in the rule package. Next slide. And lastly, these are the rules on recognition and court orders. Next slide. So I just wanted to close my remarks with a suggestion. This is my public service announcement. Um, you might have noticed that as part of our initiatives to protect the integrity of the trademark register from false claims of use and fraudulent submissions more generally, we're implementing disincentives for maintaining inaccurate registrations, or perhaps to be more positive, I should say we're incentivizing accurate registrations. Um, but one disincentive implemented in January 2021, as I noted, was the deletion fee. And of course, the other is the TMA expungement and reexamination proceedings. So registrants should keep registrations clear of any goods and services on which the mark is not in current use. Uh, to incentivize this behavior, the USPTO established the zero fee for filing a Section 7 amendment to delete unused goods and services from the registration. Now you wanna use this mechanism because you wanna avoid the deletion fee in the context of the post-registration examination or audit, and you wanna avoid uh, an expungement or re-examination proceeding uh, simply because you didn't clean up your registration. So I highly recommend that registrants and their representatives review the registrations for accuracy and make adjustments now through this free process and it certainly would avoid being targeted. So that was my, per my PSA uh, to clean up your registrations early and often. Thank you very much. This concludes my remarks today. Those seeking CLE credit should record this keyword in your record of attendance and fill out the evaluation forms. Uh, send the forms to uh, lanumcle at uspto.gov at the conclusion of the program on June 18th. So now I'd like to turn to a few of the questions that we got in the chat. Um, all right, so I don't think we have many. So the first one is, how and where do we provide feedback on the options for trademark office action response periods? So again, as you saw, regulations.gov, that's where your formal comments go. If you just send them to the USPTO, they are not considered formal. They're just helpful information for us, but they are not included in the record and we're not obliged to respond to those in the final rule. So if you send us comments in the rulemaking process, regulations.gov, we can respond in the final rule. Next question, what was the rationale for believing that dead weight 
and bad faith applicants would be deterred by a $125 extension fee for an office action response when it has not deterred initial applications into numerous classes and notice of allowance response fees. It goes on, this heavily prejudices good clients on smaller budgets. So what data was relied upon to conclude that a fee-based extension protocol was a worthy mechanism to address this problem? Why not amplify use of examiner discretion of bad specimens or increasing the requirement of more specimens to be a per claim basis instead of per class? Wouldn't that be superior? Well, there's a whole lot packed into that one. So I think the question is that shortening the response period and requiring a $125 fee in this commenter's point would not deter bad faith applications. And I think I would agree with that. <laughs> um, shortening the response period was not an attempt to uh, deter bad faith filings. There's a whole lot of other initiatives that the USPTO is pursuing to deter bad faith filings. So the flexible response period was an effort to um, move away from this idea that, that a response to an office action need, has to be six months. We should give everyone six months to respond. Because if we give everyone six months to respond, there are applications that are sitting on the register for a long, sitting in the application process. They're sitting on the register and they make it very difficult to clear your mark. You want that application that's in front of you, that's blocking you off. You want, if, if particularly if it's a non-meritorious application, you want it to be refused and get out of your way so you can get on the registrant, on the registrate, on the register. So that was the, the intent of the flexible response period was to move things through the system faster, to allow for folks to clear marks quicker and, and get on the register. We didn't want to be a block to that. So certainly this is not going to deter bad faith applications, no question. Um, so the idea, however, that uh, smaller budgets um, are going to be prejudiced by shortening the response period or, or paying the, the extension fee, I'm, uh, the data doesn't really bear that out. Uh, the data, as I said, um, showed us that, you know, probably half of, of the responses were filed from all kinds of registrant, uh, all kinds of applicants in the first one to two months. Uh, and then at the very right at the fifth month, um, then we see another surge. But for the rest of the time, it goes way down. Uh, so from that standpoint, there's a whole lot of people who file responses early and often, and therefore we need to move those through the system uh, faster. And would it be nice if we could get everybody to move through the system faster? So I'm not sure I, I follow the logic that we're, we are penalizing those on a smaller budget because I think that those are the ones who are generally filing more quickly so that they can, can get to market faster with their mark. Um, they certainly want to get their business going. Uh, so I really appreciate the question. Uh, I think there's uh, certainly a lot of other procedures that we're looking at to try to deter bad faith. Um, and you did raise the issue of more specimens. Um, we have gone out to stakeholders on multiple occasions and said, hey, do you want us to require one specimen per good or service? So each good or service in an application would have to provide a specimen. Um, our stakeholders, uh, and maybe you're not one of, of, of the stakeholders who responded this way, but many, most of them said, no way, we don't we don't want to do that. That would be a huge burden on clients. That would be a huge burden on attorneys. And it would be a huge burden on the USPTO. Um, if you add, let's see, let's say you add 15 minutes uh, to an examiner's review of the initial application. So right now it's about 40 minutes. You add 15 minutes uh, because they have to go through and check the specimens um, on every good and service. Uh, first action pendency goes to seven months. Now I know right now it's getting, it looks bad because right now we're, we're, our pendency is high because of the surge we're dealing with and we're certainly taking action to try to address that as quickly as we can and get pendency back to our normal ranges. Um, but seven months for, for an initial office action response, um, that's, that's a lot. It's not what our customers are used to. Now, if when you're balancing quality and pendency, that's the way our stakeholders wanna go, let us know. That's why I wanted to highlight the comment period that we have here. We want to hear from you. You tell us where you want that pendulum to swing. Does it swing to quality? Does it swing to pendency? Um, which way do you want us to go? Uh, we're happy to look at that. Uh, but certainly we have heard uh, over many years, every time we've proposed uh, a, per specimen, you know, a specimen per good, 
we have gotten uh, pushback. We've been we've been consulting with stakeholders since 2010 on various issues on the register integrity. Okay, so the next question we have is on all of these non-use procedures. Seems like each successful case reflects fraud on the PTO. Does that come into play? Oh, I love that question. Um, when we started uh, this this we down the road of trying to figure out. If you remember in Ray Bose 2009, the threshold for fraud went up, right? Went up. Um, and at that point, we started seeing identifications of goods and services get longer and longer. And we were like, oh, is, is that a direct response to Bose? What is that? Um, so we started the audit program in 2012 as a pilot program, and we have measured uh, the deletion rate from 2012 to 2021. The deletion rate, 50% deleted goods and services. We have, we have audited 5,000 registration maintenance filings every year, uh, in the last, mostly in the last five years. We have audited a lot, and the 50% deletion rates, people are still filing inaccurate declarations. Is that fraud? When we asked our stakeholders several years ago, can we lower the threshold to fraud? Can we lower it to negligence so that you know you, sh you knew or you should have known that you were submitting an inaccurate use claim? Do you want us, can we do that? Can we go to Congress with that? Congress said no because the stakeholders screamed. They did not want to do that. So while I wanted that, that was not something that was going to work. Uh, so we went a different way. We went a different way and we started looking at expungement. So the, you know, the idea that the mark was supposed to be in use because a mark is not a mark unless it's used in commerce. It's supposed to be in use. It was not used. Get it out. It's not subject to abandonment because it was never used. It's not a mark, right? like I said. So we started looking at the, the Canadians and try to see pull from that. Um, and then reexamination. Hey, you swore to us that this, you know, this specimen of use was good and that the mark was in use on these, all of these goods and services. Did you tell us the truth? So we're going to go back and look at that when a third party gives us that information. We can't go back and open up registrations, um, but this proceeding now gives, gives us a way for a third party to put that evidence in front of us and we decide whether we can do this. Now we can do it on our own too. The director has the authority to initiate proceedings in expungement and reexamination. So now we now have the authority to open up the registration just on claims of use and look at it. That was getting around the fraud conundrum. The people didn't want us to go. Now, if we were doing fraud, we would cancel the whole class, right? Um, and so that's the distinction. We're only canceling the goods where use was not established. We're not canceling the whole class. That would be a fraud claim, and that's not what we're doing here. So great question. How will a new attorney submit a new power if they do not have a role in the record? Do they have to get permission from the owner? And how is that going to work? Will the owner have to file something? Another great question that I don't have the answer to yet. We certainly are aware of this and we're, we are working to figure out how this will all work seamlessly. Um, one of the things that we're going to do is have a transition period uh, where we're not gonna pull all of the attorney information out of all the records. Um, we're, we're, we're gonna leave the attorney information in the record so that, that it's still in there and you're, um, in, as we transition to this new, new way of working. But I, stay tuned, submit that comment in, if you don't mind, to regulations.gov so we have it in the record and then we, um, we have to respond to it in the final rule. I would really appreciate that because there, there's a lot of, of smart people thinking about how this is gonna work and the more, uh, the more of these thorny issues that we hear about, um, certainly the, the, the better the final rule will be. Okay, so that's the last question that I see. Great questions, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to be with you today, uh, and and hopefully um, this is a good end to your day. Thank you, Amy, and great relevant information on this new TMA environment that we're about to encounter. We hope you all enjoyed day one of the 75th anniversary of the Lanham Act. Thanks to all the terrific speakers and panelists who generously shared their time and knowledge with us today. Uh, don't forget to register for your MCLE credit. If you missed anything, uh, we plan to post the entire program on the website at www.lanham75.org. Now, tomorrow's program features a phenomenal lineup of speakers, a blockbuster panel discussion, special guests, and concludes with the world premiere of the 75 years of the Lanham Act. You're not going to want to miss any of this. Please remember to send any questions you may have with respect to this CLE to Lanham CLE at USPTO.org. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you so much. Good day.